Deep in the hills of Arkansas, an army of extremists plot to overturn the U.S. government. They spread a doctrine of hate, murder, and genocide. Launch death raids on churches and synagogues, bomb public utilities, and gun down a state trooper. Federal agents must dismantle the radical renegades without inciting a bloody war. In 1984, a tragic murder led agents into the frightening world of domestic terrorism. Law enforcement vowed to dismantle the violent faction that claimed responsibility. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The radical group pursued a doctrine of racial cleansing, an attack on basic American freedoms. The FBI's quest for justice escalated into a brutal showdown, pitting agents against terrorists fueled by hate. June 1984, Sevier County, Arkansas, a rural area along the Oklahoma border. Winona Bryant drives south on US Highway 71. Winona is a teacher at a local high school. She's traveling with her children and her nephew to meet her husband for lunch. He is Lewis Bryant, an Arkansas state trooper. He patrols this stretch of highway. Along the way, Winona spots a police cruiser on the side of the road. She recognizes the ID number. That's Dad's car. Lewis is nowhere in sight. Something's wrong. Winona tells the children to stay in the car. Stay in the car. Then she sees him. Covered with blood. Winona struggles to stay calm as she uses the police radio to call for help. Officer down! Officer down! Police! Somebody! Officer down! Somebody! She tells the dispatcher that Lewis is unconscious. It looks like he's been shot. Let's get somebody here! He's been shot! The Arkansas State Police dispatcher alerts all police frequencies that an officer is down. Passing motors stop to help. Winona can feel a faint heartbeat, but her husband isn't breathing. She administers CPR until county authorities arrive. Paramedics rush Bryant to a nearby hospital where he is pronounced dead. Trooper Lewis Bryant was a respected veteran of the Arkansas State Police. He leaves behind his wife, Winona, and their two children. Within minutes of the shooting, the Dequeen, Arkansas Sheriff's Department receives a frantic call. A driver on Highway 71 reports seeing a brown and white van leaving the scene. It was pulling a homemade trailer. Police in Broken Bow, Oklahoma, spot the van heading west. The 
driver refuses to stop, but police force him to the side of the road. As officers converge on the van, the driver pulls out a rifle and starts shooting. Police strike the suspect in the shoulder. He pulls out a 45 caliber pistol and continues firing. hit him four more times, finally forcing him down. Police search the wounded suspect and find a driver's license identifying him as Richard Wayne Snell of Stephenville, Texas. At a nearby hospital, Police question Snell. The suspect confesses to shooting the state trooper. Snell tells police he has outstanding warrants in Texas and he was trying to escape arrest. As Bryant approached the car, Snell opened fire. Agents from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation search Snell's van. They discover a metal box containing a 22 semi-automatic pistol and a grenade. They also find suspicious wires attached to the underside of the steering wheel column, leading to the air conditioner vent. They fear the van is booby-trapped. Investigators call in a bomb squad from the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Technicians carefully examine the vehicle. After several tense moments, they conclude the van is not rigged to explode. The search of the vehicle resumes. Investigators find several more weapons, including a Mac-10 machine pistol. They also find literature printed by a group of white supremacists called the CSA, the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. You're labeling them all the same. The group advocates the violent overthrow of the United States government. In their literature, they call for the murder of government agents and the extermination of Jews and blacks. Police call in agent Bill Buford of the ATF. Along with other federal investigators, Buford has been trying to establish a criminal case against the CSA for nearly two years. Looking for evidence, Buford makes a chilling discovery. In the van was a briefcase. And in the briefcase was a lot of notes that this individual had put together, uh, different maps. And one of the things that I noticed immediately was a map apparently of my house the street it was on the uh, different houses that surrounded my place and uh, that caused me a little consternation to say the least it was later established that they had also been doing surveillance on a federal judge the US attorney an FBI agent for whatever reason uh, whether they just wanted to know where we lived or whether they were anticipating retaliation for some whatever. Um, that's just left up to one's own imagination, I guess. Buford examines the weapons retrieved from the van. One of the things that came to my attention almost immediately was that the MAC-10 had a silencer on it. The silencer is homemade but sophisticated. 
marks. These are homemade Bill marks. Buford believes he has seen one just like it, confiscated just three months earlier. In early April, Missouri police caught three men stealing a flatbed trailer. In their possession were three 45 semi-automatic pistols, one sawed-off shotgun, and one Mac-10 converted to fully automatic with a homemade silencer. According to an informant, all three men are members of the CSA. The two silencers looked exactly the same. And I felt like this might be a break if we could determine that these two silencers uh, were made by the same people and were able to establish that they had come from the CSA compound. Five days after the shooting, on July 5th, 1984, Trooper Lewis Bryant is laid to rest. The funeral is attended by then Governor Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and over a thousand police officers. Governor Clinton makes the investigation of extremist groups a priority. Is to set up a, a group comprising members of both districts under the chairmanship of Colonel Goodwin to work on these cases. State and federal agents probe deeper into Snell's connection to the CSA. The murder weapon in the Bryant case was a 45 caliber Colt commander. 18 months earlier, the gun had been stolen in a deadly pawn shop holdup in Texarkana, Arkansas. The owner had been shot three times in the back of the head. Ballistics analysis shows a bullet recovered from the victim had been fired by a 22 caliber Ruger. The same 22 Ruger found in Snell's van. According to records, the leader of the CSA purchased that Ruger four years earlier. Agents now have enough evidence to subpoena the leader of the CSA to appear before a federal grand jury on gun charges. Bill Buford heads to Mountain Home, Arkansas to deliver the subpoena to the CSA leader at his 200-acre compound. Informants and surveillance indicate that the compound is heavily fortified. Several structures dot the surveillance photos. Agents know the compound is inhabited by the CSA leadership and approximately 65 men, women, and children. They know little else. ATF investigators had become aware of the CSA several years earlier. The organization had evolved from a religious group into a violent right-wing militia. When ATF began to really think that this was more than just a Bible study group was when we uh, were aware of the large number of right-wing organizations that were coming in and doing the paramilitary training there. About another 150 yards According up. to informants, extremist groups such as the Aryan Nation, the Posse Comitatus, and the Order frequently visited the compound. They're watching us tight, so... A few low-level members of the CSA had been arrested for firearms violations. But the leadership of the group had always managed to evade prosecution for all but misdemeanor offenses. Buford hoped today would mark the beginning of the end for this dangerous organization. Agent Buford meets a man at the front gate who identifies himself as Kerry Noble, the group's second in command. He went into the compound, and a short time later he came back and said, well, the leader of the group will meet with you, but only you, and you have to go down unarmed, and I have to search you to make sure you haven't got a gun on you. Buford agrees to turn his weapon over to another ATF agent. He allows himself to be searched. He knows that going into the compound alone and unarmed is dangerous, but there's no other choice. If one of the people that was working for me or one of the agents under my supervision had wanted to do it, I wouldn't have let him do it. But uh, at the time, it seemed like the right thing. The stakes are too high. The group is too dangerous. Buford needs to show the CSA 
that federal agents will not be intimidated. In Arkansas, State Trooper Lewis Bryant is gunned down during a routine traffic stop. Investigators discover weapons connecting Bryant's killer to a group of violent white supremacists calling themselves the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. ATF agent Bill Buford enters the group's heavily fortified compound to deliver a subpoena ordering the group's leader to appear before a federal grand jury. The ATF agent enters alone and unarmed. It was kind of an awesome sight. At first glance, it looked like just a community there with a number of buildings. But as you looked closer, you saw that these buildings were all rock structures, uh, very well made. Uh, if you looked closely, you could see that there were bunkers dug uh, around the compound itself. Buford confronts the CSA leader face to face. I got a subpoena in my jacket. I explained to him uh, that I had a subpoena from the federal grand jury in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and uh, that he would need to appear on the date on the subpoena. The subpoena concerns weapons involved in the murder of a state trooper. Investigators have traced some of the weapons back to the CSA. Uh, he asked if he would be arrested. I assured him that the grand jury appearance uh, was all this was that was not an arrest warrant, that he wouldn't be arrested. The leader takes the subpoena. His men escort Buford out of the compound. When the CSA leader eventually appears before the grand jury, he denies knowing Richard Wayne Snell, the man who confessed to the murder of Trooper Lewis Bryant. He also claims no knowledge of how weapons traced to him ended up in Snell's possession. On November 1st, 1984, Richard Wayne Snell is found guilty of capital murder in the shooting death of State Trooper Lewis Bryant. He is sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. On the same day, Snell is charged with the murder of a pawn shop owner in Texarkana, Arkansas. In the winter of 1985, the FBI, the ATF, and the Arkansas U.S. Attorney's Office turn up the heat on the CSA. FBI Special Agent Jack Knox has developed a key informant who claims the CSA is involved in acts of domestic terrorism. He outlined what he referred to as road trips in which he and two other members of the CSA were assigned by the leader of the CSA to take uh, in search of uh, businesses or establishments to plunder or Jewish establishments which they might attack. According to the informant, two years before the murder of the Arkansas State Trooper, several CSA members had set fire to a Jewish community center in Bloomington, Indiana. Foreman claimed that at about the same time, the CSA firebombed a church in Springfield, Missouri that welcomed gay members. He also claimed that three months later, the CSA attempted to bomb a major natural gas pipeline in Fulton, Arkansas, to disrupt supplies across the Midwest. The 
they were unsuccessful. The pipeline was not damaged. But assistant U.S. attorney Steve Snyder could see a dangerous pattern emerging. There were what appeared to be random acts of violence. But after this individual talked, they no longer became random acts of violence. They became part of a plan to strike out against the United States and attempt to disrupt the activities of the United States and its citizens. The CSA had evolved from a religious cult into a group of domestic terrorists that had declared war on the United States. In March 1985, a second informant, a former member of the CSA, provides more information about the organization. He gives details about firearms and explosives being manufactured and used by the group. He tells investigators there is a machine shop in the compound where the CSA makes grenades and silencers and illegally converts semi-automatic weapons to fully automatic. He also claims the group has obtained a powerful anti-tank rocket, commonly called a law. The FBI informant reports that the CSA is building an armored tank and that landmines have been placed around the perimeter of the compound. He also provides a laundry list of interstate offenses committed by the group, including transportation of stolen vehicles, mail fraud, and theft of government property. Based on the informant's statements, the U.S. attorney pursues a warrant to search the CSA compound for illegal weapons and explosives. Assistant U.S. Attorney Snyder intends to use RICO, a federal racketeering statute, to prosecute the CSA. The statute enables authorities to arrest and convict leaders of criminal organizations based on a pattern of illegal activities. The RICO statute carried a statutory maximum penalty of 20 years, as opposed to the uh, weapons and firearms violations, which uh, carried a lesser penalty. So it was a, a more severe uh, crime. If I can show you this bigger map, maybe Investigators can... discuss how to best serve the warrant. Again, this is the compound. Bill Buford opposes a kick in the door approach. It was obvious to me that we were dealing with a very militant organization. They were not, in fact, going to just roll over. If we walked in and say, hey, we're the federal government, we're here to look at your compound, they weren't going to allow us to do that. To reduce the risk of a violent battle, the FBI would employ the newly formed hostage rescue team to serve the warrants. The HRT was established in 1982 as a counter-terrorism unit to work both inside and outside the borders of the United States. In 1985, Special Agent Danny Colson is the commander of the HRT. And the HRT basically are assaulters. It's their job to go into a crisis point and neutralize terrorists and rescue hostages. But this was not that type of situation. Uh, these people are very well armed. And they were very formidable. And uh, we wanted to avoid a shootout. Colson establishes a command post in nearby Branson, Missouri. The HRT is composed of two elite teams. Basically, you had a sniper element and you had an operator element. The snipers were responsible for gathering intelligence to uh, give cover to uh, the operators. And the bulk of the team was made up of operators. Agent Buford, who has been inside the compound, briefs Colson on the layout the main gravel access road, the front gate, and where the property borders the shore of a man-made lake. The first phase of the operation is a reconnaissance mission. You cannot command and control a crisis situation unless the commander's done a recon. He has to go in and see the ground. He has to know what the structures are like, where they are relative to each other, and what the best avenue of approach to get there in the, in the shortest period of time is. Tonight, Colson and his team will be the uninvited guests of the CSA. In Arkansas, local and federal authorities believe an extremist group is involved in domestic terrorism. They call themselves the CSA, the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord.
the FBI's hostage rescue team prepares to enter the terrorists' heavily fortified compound. Where the compound is or anything else, last chance. HRT commander Danny Colson briefs the reconnaissance team before they go in. The recon team's job is to gather intelligence on the group's infrastructure, its buildings, manpower, and weapons, while avoiding the CSA's armed patrols. ATF agent Bill Buford will act as the HRT's guide. He's been inside the compound and knows the layout. I had been doing so much work on the CSA and had spent so much time in the woods out around the compound that I had a good idea of the terrain, the fortifications on the compound, and had drawn up a raid plan myself as to what I felt should be done in order to execute the safely. FBI Special Agent Danny Colson knows the CSA is well-armed and dangerous. These individuals had assault rifles. They had night vision capability. They had an excellent communication system. They were well-trained. They practiced their tradecraft, which means marksmanship. Still, Colson has every faith in his team. The HRT has excellent patrolling skills. And it was just a matter of, of relying on our training. You move very quietly. You move very slowly. You crawl in your stomach. You stop and you listen. You look. And you rely on your senses. We would send a person on point. Uh, he would scour the area and glass it with the thermal imaging gear. You listen to the noise of the forest. If something interrupts that, you know that somebody's there that's not supposed to be. The team spots CSA guards patrolling the compound. They're armed with assault rifles. We finally signaled that it was safe, and we moved the rest of the patrol in. And we sort of leapfrog in and out, and we had a rear guard to be sure that they came around behind us. The thing that was concerned most about, of course, is the law rocket. You don't have to be a real good shot with a law rocket to kill a lot of people. It'll take out a light tank or a bunker, fired into my perimeter, could have killed my agents. The recon team finally makes its way to the main compound. CSA members, as well as their families, are asleep inside some of the buildings. The assault team leader needed to know what the structures looked like in case we had to breach them. So you have the possibility that there could be a suicide pact with these people. And they might start killing their children. That's happened before, it's happened since then. And so we had to be prepared to go in there to rush in and save innocent lives. From the reconnaissance missions, Colson now knows exactly how the CSA compound is laid out and what needs to be done. Well, the thing that the recon really reinforced was that we don't want to assault these guys. I mean, if we had to, we could do it, but there would be great loss of lives on their side and possibly on our side. The compound sits on over 200 acres of land. If Colson hopes to resolve this without bloodshed, he'll need a lot more men. After we saw how expansive this facility was there, I knew that 50 men could not hold that perimeter. Colson calls for an additional 200 FBI agents from field offices across the country. He needs to sneak them into the small community without tipping off the CSA. Knowing Mountain Home, Arkansas is famous for its sports fishing, FBI agents disguise themselves as fishermen. They check into fishing camps located along the river. The plan is to use fishing boats to approach the compound at its weakest point from the lake. 
as agents prepare to move on the compound. Colson briefs Special Agent Clint Van Zant of the FBI's hostage negotiation unit. You've got about five options in any type of situation. You can contain, isolate, and negotiate. You can contain and demand surrender. You can use snipers, you can use tear gas, or you can use a direct tactical assault and just overwhelm them with manpower and firepower. Uh, in these last three, people die. The decision is made to contain, isolate, and negotiate. Danny Colson is the point man on all three phases of the operation. This man's using I came to believe rather quickly that the leader of CSA is not going to want to negotiate with a lower ranking FBI negotiator. He's going to want to talk to his tactical equivalent. In this case, it's going to be Danny Colson. And I wasn't comfortable with that. I'm a tactical person. I'd been a sniper and I'd been a SWAT team member and a SWAT team leader and trained as an operator. And I was not trained to be a negotiator. And uh, I didn't know that I could pull that off. Uh, I'm much more comfortable going in after the guy than trying to talk him out. But Van Zandt convinces Colson that he's the right man for the job. I had viewed a lot of negotiations. I mean, every time a tactical team is deployed, a negotiator is deployed with them. So I'd seen it done. And uh, basically, Clint Van Zandt taught me some negotiation strategies and techniques. After 10 days of reconnaissance and planning, Special Agent Danny Colson and the FBI hostage rescue team are ready. Over 200 law enforcement agents prepare to surround one of the most dangerous and heavily armed outlaw militias in the country. In 1985, the FBI closes in on the CSA, a paramilitary organization in Arkansas. Members of the group are suspected of domestic terrorism and murder. Over 200 agents, led by the FBI's hostage rescue team, make their move. HRT snipers and operatives deploy across a lake that borders the compound. Their mission is to establish a rear perimeter. Additional HRT units fan out in the woods, flanking the main compound. The ATF, along with the Arkansas State Police and the Missouri Highway Patrol, set up roadblocks. Their job is to prevent any CSA supporters from entering or leaving the compound. Overhead, an FBI surveillance aircraft called the Night Stalker cruises at an altitude of 50,000 feet. The plane's onboard thermal imaging system monitors movement throughout the compound. FBI Special Agent Danny Colson. You could see everything going on on the ground. We saw CSA people standing and talking to each other in, in little groups around the compound. We could see every animal, every deer, every coyote, rabbits running around on the ground, which gave me a tremendous, a tremendous advantage. Because I could use this vehicle, this airplane, to help me set my perimeter. Uh, they could maneuver my people around listening posts, they could maneuver my people around patrols. Colson directs the mission from a command and control vehicle near the front gate of the compound. Special Agent Clint Van Zant, an FBI hostage negotiator, advises Colson. It was very prudent to go in at night and to have them wake up the next morning and find that we had walked literally right up to them without them knowing it. We could have come all the way in, but we didn't do it because we want to resolve this peacefully. HRT snipers surveil the compound from positions inside and near the main gate. Within 10 minutes, they report that two men are exiting the compound and approaching their position. Sniper one to command post. Instructions, please, have individuals coming out of the compound gate. 
And I radioed back and said, do they know you're there? He said, no, they haven't seen us yet. The sniper tells Colson that one man has an assault rifle. The other has a sidearm. Individuals getting closer, command post, instructions, please. Colson instructs his men to confront the CSA guards. I said, you hail them, you yell at them, and tell them you're the FBI, and tell them to go back inside. You copy. Tell them to get back inside the compound. The message it sends is that we could have got you, but we chose not to do it. Basically, we we are here in force, but we come in peace. FBI, stay in the compound! I wanted them to get in the habit of following my orders or the orders of my team and to show them that we weren't there to hurt them. We're hearing from the tactical agents that there are lights, that there are activities within the compound. We'll go with you. Now, you better stay back here. Moments later, another man walks out of the compound. Who's out here? I instructed him to let him get close, and I wanted two operators to take him into custody. FBI, freeze! Don't move! Freeze! I didn't order him back in because I wanted to start the dialogue. It's time to talk now. Sometimes one of the most difficult things about a standoff situation is finding somebody to talk to. You don't always get them to talk to you initially. The man identifies himself. He's Kerry Noble the deputy commander of the CSA. The first thing I said to him is we need to start a dialogue and talk about resolving this thing peacefully. We're not here to hurt anybody. But you're not getting out. And if you start a war, we're going to end it. Noble says he will convey the FBI's request to talk with his commander. At daybreak, federal agents and local police have completely surrounded the compound. The news media somehow gets hold of the story and converges along access roads. Agents establish a direct telephone line into the compound. A short time later, Agent Colson receives a call. The operator called me over and said, it's, uh, it's him, and it was the leader. And essentially said the same thing that I'd said to his deputy, is that this is the FBI, my name is Danny Colson, we have a warrant for your arrest. And the, only way gonna happen... the leader agrees to come out and talk on one condition, Hold on a that he will not be arrested. Otherwise, his people will put up a fight. Okay. Colson agrees you to the it. terms. Five minutes, I'll see you then. Van Zant prepares Colson for the meeting. As an expert in behavioral science, Van Zant believes the CSA leader will only respond to another commander. As a military commander, I said, you, you wouldn't be carrying a long gun, a rifle in this type of meeting, but you'd have your nine millimeter pistols. You'll meet his expectation as to what our FBI tactical commander should look like he'll be more open to dialogue, more open to negotiations. Colson approaches the main gate. You should always look like you're in charge. But also, you have to, to bring him out. You have to get him to talk. It's not just you walk up and give demands. You get him to talk to you. Tensions mount for a possible violent confrontation. FBI snipers train their sights on the CSA leader and his guards. And you have to understand that this is a man who thought we were literally from the devil, that we were agents of the devil. So trying to create a bond of trust on a road with two armies facing each other with awesome firepower is a difficult thing to do. Colson tells the CSA leader that the FBI is there to confiscate grenades, assault rifles, the law, anti-tank rocket, all illegal weapons stored in the compound. And eventually, I really didn't describe the forces. I just said, we're here, we've been here, we know what's going on in there, and at this point, I wanted to remain the faceless enemy. 
what I got from him was dialogue, which is the most important thing. But what I didn't get was capitulation. He didn't agree to do anything. He just agreed that they would go back in and pray about it. Well, I respect that. We'd agreed earlier if he came out that he could go back in. And that's very important. Uh, you have to keep that trust. Colson and Van Zant have no choice but to honor their agreement. They allow the leader to go back inside the compound. The first day and night of the siege passes without incident or resolution. On day two of the siege, the CSA commander requests another meeting. This time, he appears in full battle dress. Changing clothing is a big deal. When the leader of CSA puts on tactical clothes, he's taking the presence of a tactical commander. The leader of the CSA tells Colson that there are people inside the compound who are prepared to launch an assault and break out. And my patience was wearing really thin at this time. And uh, I said to him, who are you going to fight? You've not seen us. You don't know where we are. We are going to use deadly force on you if you come out with weapons and, and come onto my perimeter. Who are you going to shoot? You haven't even seen us yet. How are you going to shoot us? It's like you're fighting ghosts, and you won't even know who kills you. You need to come out of there. Now, you get in there and convince them to get out of here right now. The leader tells Colson he is prepared to come out, but he can't control everyone in the compound. And he said to me, I need help. He said, there's a man that, that's our spiritual leader, and I need his advice, and I need, I need his help to convince people that's the thing to do to come out. And I said, who is this? He said, it's Robert Millar. Robert Millar is a well-known figure in the secretive world of right-wing extremists. It's an unusual demand. But to Van Zant, it's a turning point in the negotiation. This situation was either going to be resolved by bullets or it was going to be resolved by trust. Bullets or trust, what's it going to be? For Colson, it is the moment of truth. He knows that if the shooting starts, there is no telling when it will stop. In the mountains of Arkansas, over 200 law enforcement agents surround an armed compound. Inside are a group of violent right-wing extremists, the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. The leader of the CSA demands to see Robert Millar, their spiritual leader. FBI Special Agent Danny Coulson decides to use Millar to help persuade CSA members to leave the compound. This is something totally against FBI policy, to bring in a Confederate into a crisis situation, not just to negotiate, but to go inside. And this is a huge risk. And I thought it was worth taking, given the risk that we were facing. The FBI flies Millar in from Oklahoma. Special Agent Clint Van Zant tries to convince Millar that it will be in the group's best interests if he helps bring the standoff to an end. I said, you know, if you're able to do this, if you're able to resolve this peacefully, you'll be known as the peacemaker within your movement. I said, I don't say that to win you over. I say to tell you that you've got a lot riding on this. And you can see the wheels turning. It was at that moment I thought, he's flipped over on our side. He's on our side. He's going to do it. And this was all the chips. We're saying, we're going to bet on this guy that he's going to drive home the message that Danny and myself and everybody else has been delivering for the last four days. Now, he's got to close the deal. And he called on the field phone. And Millar said, well, I'm in here talking to them, but I really haven't got anything resolved. They said, OK, you got another hour. Well, really, we couldn't control him. What are we going to do, go in and grab him by the neck and rip him out of that compound where there was 50 people with guns inside? 
So you had to be real careful of not, you will be out of there, because then it would have been apparent we were an empty suit. We were a paper tiger, and we couldn't be perceived as that. So it had to be, well, I really need you out of there in an hour. And uh, he called back in an hour, and he said, I need, I need more time with these folks. I think I can do it. I've got them coming along, but, but I need more time. And we just reconciled ourselves that he's going to stay there the night. On the morning of April 22nd, day four of the siege, Millar and the CSA leadership exit the compound. For the first time yeah, since the beginning of the standoff, there are no armed men with the CSA leader. They came out and they said, we have an agreement that we will surrender. We will come out and we'll give up our arms and walk out peacefully. Colson receives the news with guarded optimism. And I said to them, that's a great decision, but I want you to understand that this better not be a ruse for an escape attempt because you will not survive it. This better be a surrender. Colson gives the leader 15 minutes to gather his people and bring them out. And very shortly after, I get a, a communication from my sniper team that they're coming. They're coming out. The snipers report that they're in uh, civilian attire. There's no camis, there's no, there's no battle gear, there's no weapons that they can see. The siege is over. Not a single shot has been fired. It was an ending that we had all prayed for, and one that we were very fortunate that we had. ATF and FBI agents carefully search the compound, accompanied by the deputy commander of the CSA, Kerry Noble. Over the course of several days, they recover hundreds of automatic weapons, homemade hand grenades, and landmines, as well as detonator boxes and plastic explosives. Agents find a long anti-tank rocket near the leader's house. They find 30 gallons of cyanide stored inside steel drums. Agents believe the CSA intended to use it to pollute municipal water supplies. Investigators also find a steel-plated armored car equipped with a fully automatic machine gun. At trial, the leader of the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord is sentenced to 20 years in prison for federal RICO violations. Kerry Noble, the CSA's deputy commander, receives a five-year sentence for firearm violations. Today, he speaks publicly about the dangers of hate groups and destructive cults. Richard Wayne Snell, already serving a life sentence for the murder of Arkansas State Trooper Lewis Bryant, is found guilty of murdering a pawn shop owner. He is sentenced to death. On April 19, 1995, at 9.16 p.m., Snell is executed by lethal injection. Today, the CSA compound is little more than a collection of abandoned shacks and stone ruins. In 1996, Spokane, Washington is gripped by a series of violent robberies and bombings. The FBI links the crimes to a radical group determined to overthrow the government. Facing deadly traps and a nearly invisible foe, investigators vow to stop the shadowy extremists, ready to unleash more domestic terror.
Constitution of the United States allows for the lawful expression of any belief. But when a paramilitary faction used bombs and robbery to further their cause, they crossed the line. The well-organized terror cell was difficult to define and even harder to stop. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the group stockpiled weapons for an assault, the FBI and local police were determined to bring them to justice. Spokane, Washington, a city of 200,000 near the state's eastern border with Idaho. On Monday, April 1st, 1996, two dozen people were working inside a satellite office of the city's Spokesman Review newspaper. At 2.30 p.m., a van pulled up behind the building. It was there less than 15 seconds. Inside, a reporter had finished his work and was looking forward to spending the afternoon with his son. They did not realize what was waiting for them outside. Despite significant damage to the building, nobody was injured. Units from the Spokane County Sheriff's Department responded to the 911 calls. The reporter and his son had not seen anything suspicious. But one employee said that seconds before the blast, she saw a masked man jump into a white van that sped away from behind the building. She didn't get a license plate number. While much of local law enforcement was at the newspaper office, a white van pulled up outside Spokane's U.S. Bank several miles away. It had been 15 minutes since the newspaper bombing. Two armed, masked men burst into the bank and announced they were robbing it. As they passed her, one teller tripped the silent alarm. The robbers threatened to detonate a pipe bomb if anyone disobeyed their orders. They warned the teller not to give them dye packs, paint canisters designed to explode and stain stolen money, and bank robbers. Once the gunmen had their money, they herded everyone into a corner. They trained their guns on the hostages, allowing valuable seconds to tick by as the fuse burned. At the newspaper office crime scene, investigators heard radio reports about the bank robbery and explosion. That scene was secure, so several detectives headed to the new crime scene. And the sheriff's office dispatched more deputies to the bank. At the time, Special Agent Mark Cullinan of the FBI's Spokane Resident Agency was on his way to the newspaper bombing with his partner. While en route, uh, we received a call that, that a bank robbery had occurred. Another bomb had been set off inside the bank. Uh, since my primary investigative jurisdiction was bank robberies, I immediately diverted to the bank. 
the employees and customers were shaken, but safe. They believed everyone had gotten out before the blast. But investigators had not yet declared the crime scene secure. Explosives Disposal Unit Supervisor Sergeant James Goodwin had to make sure it was safe for police to check the building. We were concerned about the possibility of a second device uh, because any time you have an explosive device related incident, you, if you have one, there is always at least a potential that you have another. Bombers sometimes leave a second device behind as a booby trap, specifically to target law enforcement. The explosives disposal unit swept the bank, determining it was clear of additional bombs or victims, and radioed to those outside that it was safe to process the scene. OK, it's all clear. You, you gonna get on the phone and see what you can get. The assailants were fast and organized, getting in and out in seconds and making off with $50,000. They weren't typical bank robbers. Bank robberies are usually conducted by lone individuals who are seeking uh, money to support a drug habit or something uh, along those lines. Uh, to have somebody in an organized manner come in and take over a bank with this much violence and, and uh, prior planning it is an unusual occurrence. Agents questioned one witness who was in the bank's parking lot when the robbery took place. She said after the explosion, she saw two masked men run from the bank and get into a white van. A third man was driving. He had gray hair and a beard. It was a white van. White van. They had the mask She had written down the van's license plate number. They learned it had been stolen from Ellensburg, Washington. Spokane Emergency Dispatch issued an APB for the van, and officers began a block-by-block -block grid search of nearby streets. At the newspaper office, FBI agents arrived and questioned the witnesses. The woman who saw the van there also mentioned that the driver was an older man with gray hair and a beard. But the most distinct clues linking the two crime scenes were leaflets containing religious propaganda, a common sight in the area. At the scene of the spokesman review bombing, and also at the bank, we did discover uh, numerous leaflets, which had obviously been left there by the robbers. Religious propaganda is pretty uh, prevalent throughout the area. Uh, a lot of times these groups will leaflet a neighborhood or an area, leaving them under windshield wipers and, and on front doorsteps, uh, just spouting their, their ideals uh, and trying to get their message out. But this group delivered their message with bombs and bank robbery. Sheriff's deputies continued their search for the getaway van. Ninety minutes after the bank robbery, one deputy spotted it in a parking lot a mile from the bank. From the back, he couldn't tell if the robbers were there. No one was inside. The dispatch advised the deputy that the van could be rigged with a bomb. The explosives disposal unit arrived in minutes. They knew the suspects might have booby-trapped the vehicle. 
If there was a bomb in the van, its trigger device could be radio controlled. Since police radios can set off such triggers, investigators ordered all radios turned off. Because they had enough open space to do so, they used a robot with a camera to check the van first. We initially sent the robot downrange uh, in an attempt to look into the van. Uh, we found that we were, we were uh, limited in what we could see, and um, we sent a technician downrange near the van uh, in a bomb suit. The others waited in the mobile command center for the technician's report. Even in the most dangerous situations, bomb technicians need to keep their hands uncovered in case they have to perform delicate tasks. It is an unavoidable risk of the job. He smelled uh, gasoline, saw what he thought to be gasoline uh, coming from uh, underneath one of the doors to the van, and saw what appeared to, to him to be a uh, time delay device that appeared to be intended to ignite the gasoline. Since the trigger was a time delay, not radio controlled, it was safe to resume using radios. Attached to the wick, the technician saw a small initiator, an element that sets the wick burning. And cousin Cindy are in that route. And what would you like to do with it? Well, look at this. I can probably ready safe it. Mark, before you, before you go ahead and separate the two, would you let us know that you're gonna do it? In an effort to preserve any evidence the van might contain, the bomb squad technician was putting his own safety in jeopardy. Okay, go ahead and make the cut. Good, get it out of there. It worked. Okay, he's got it. He's got it out of there. In the van, investigators found another copy of the manifesto the robbers left behind at the bank in newspaper bombings. Right down here, the here. To FBI Special Agent David Bedford, the rhetoric in the letter was typical of white supremacist militia groups in the area. That was more or less a long religious sermon about usury, a biblical term referring to the charging of interest. Um, and the thing that stood out most about this letter that was left behind was a symbol on the page. Compare with this one right here. Agents knew they could get help analyzing the manifesto from a Spokesman Review reporter. Bill Moreland is an expert on extremist groups in the area. For the past 22 years, I've covered uh, hate groups here in our area in the Northwest, uh, chief among them the Aryan Nations, which is 35 miles from Spokane in North Idaho. It's attracted a lot of uh, different extremists from different movements, anti-tax movement, uh, anti-abortion movements, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, Posse Comitatus. The FBI showed Moreland the robber's manifesto. It was clearly white separatist dogma, uh, but what intrigued me most was what was on the bottom of that note. It was a, the Christian cross superimposed with a capital P, and it's what I knew to be the logo of the Phineas priesthood. Individuals who call themselves Phineas priests say the crimes they commit are in accordance with their interpretation of God's law, sometimes robbing banks to finance a plot to overthrow the federal government. Moreland told agents about an interview he had done months earlier. As part of a story, he'd arranged to meet several members of an extremist group at a clandestine location. They did not identify themselves as Phineas priests, but they professed some similar beliefs. When we got there, we saw seven or eight individuals who were heavily armed, automatic weapons, street sweeper type shotguns, sidearms, all dressed in uh, uh, army camouflage type material. They went through a number of exercises for our benefit. The men explained they worked in cells with no formal leader, no strict organization. 
This leaderless resistance was designed to make it difficult for law enforcement to track them. They said they were preparing for an armed confrontation with the federal government. I said, well, what happens if you're driving home from this event, from this training exercise, with all your guns and your military equipment? If a police officer were to stop you on a traffic offense, what would you do? And uh, the individual I was talking to said, didn't hesitate for a minute, he said, I would kill him. I'd kill the police officer. When we're equipped like this, he said, we're running hot, and we would shoot to kill any police officer that stopped us to protect the identity of our group. Agents believed the bank robbers they were after were every bit as dangerous and elusive. After masked men robbed a bank in Spokane, Washington, and detonated bombs at the bank and a newspaper office, authorities suspected well-armed extremists who called themselves Phineas Priests. Spokesman Review newspaper reporter Bill Moreland is an expert on extremist groups in the Pacific Northwest. The FBI asked him for details about self-professed Phineas priests known to commit violent crime in the name of religion. They're secret groups, and they come together with five or six or seven of their, of their fellow people that are fellow believers and decide to carry out some sort of action. They don't tell the world about it, and you can't look them up in the phone book or on the Internet. They're very secretive. They believe that God is one of their members and that they're following his directions to carry out these crimes that they commit. Special Agent David Bedford was part of the team investigating extremist groups in the area. And here's one more thing. I wonder if you get a chance later on. This they found nothing here, related to the recent bombings. That was set out we had very few leads to go by after the uh, robbery. The individuals were masked. They wore camouflage clothing. They wore gloves. Um, very few leads to work with, other than a composite drawing of the getaway driver. The FBI hoped to have more than a vague drawing before going to the public to reduce false leads that take up time and resources. But they could not wait any longer. So what we did was publish that and sent copies all around Washington, Oregon, Idaho, with the idea, with the hopes of someone identifying this person. Information that was called in was filtered through the FBI's Rapid Start program, a database system designed to collect and organize large numbers of leads so they can be prioritized. Okay. Oh, actually, I do see it's just south of... Uh... We received hundreds and hundreds of tips or possible leads of who this individual was. And so a team of agents would go out and investigate all of these people who came in that were um, look-alikes. One by one, they eliminated suspects. James Johnson, no longer suspect. Despite spending hundreds of man hours following every viable lead, investigators came up with nothing. The case stalled. Until the assailant struck again. On July 12th, three months after the first attacks, a woman spotted a masked man placing a bomb in front of a Spokane health clinic. She called in the getaway van's license plate number. Spokane's 911 call center dispatched fire and police personnel to the scene. Like a dozen others, Deputy Dan Spivey of the Spokane Sheriff's Office started off toward the clinic. What the deputies didn't know was that the U.S. bank that was robbed in April was being hit again. This time there were three masked gunmen instead of two. Like the earlier robbery, the assailants had a bomb. One teller recognized the voice of one of the robbers and set off the silent alarm as she loaded up. Hurry up, hurry up. Let's go. Now. The men moved efficiently, spoke in code, 
and seem to be timing the robbery. They didn't notice the drive through teller who worked in a separate part of the bank. Zip it up, please. While those inside the bank were staring down the barrels of guns, everything appeared normal to customers on the outside. Hoping the robbers had not heard the customer over her loudspeaker. Hello. The drive through teller tried to get him to help. She didn't know if the customer understood her gestures. If he would help or run. Deputy Spivey was almost to the clinic when he got a more urgent call. I heard a bank robbery in progress come out at the same U.S. bank that had been robbed on April 1st. But before deputies arrived, one of the assailants announced they were at code blue and they left. Taking $37,000 in cash and the bomb with them. The drive through customers saw the men get in their van. He decided to tail them and called 911 as he drove. The plate he reported did not match the one from the health clinic, but criminals often put two different plates on stolen vehicles to confuse investigators. Spokane Emergency Dispatch advised the man not to put himself in danger. He said he would follow at a safe distance until deputies caught up. Police hoped the customer would not be spotted by the armed assailants. In July 1996, authorities believed members of an extremist militia group robbed the U.S. Bank in Spokane, Washington for the second time in three months. A customer saw the robbers leave in a van and followed. Deputy Dan Spivey was en route to the bank when he heard about the pursuit. Our dispatch advised us that a citizen with a cell phone was following that suspect vehicle and they in turn were relaying location information to us field deputies. Spivey changed directions to try to catch up. The customer gave constant updates on his location, but had a hard time keeping up with the suspect's van while not being spotted. Behind a mall area, the citizen lost the vehicle. And I quickly searched the area, attempting to locate such a vehicle. It was unsuccessful. Uh, decided to go back through the area in a more slow, methodical manner. After an hour of searching, Spivey drove into a parking lot above the downtown area. I checked an upper parking lot and at the far end of the parking lot saw what I believed to be the suspect vehicle. Excuse me, ma'am. Would you leave the area right now, please? Get on the other side of the lot. Sir, could you get away from that vehicle and go down towards the other end of the lot? Thank you. Baker 504 rear plate, 2233 Victor. One plate matched the one from the bank robbery. and the other from the health clinic bombing. No one appeared to be inside. I'll be backing up and standing by. Explosives Disposal Unit Supervisor Sergeant James Goodman, who helped defuse a bomb in a van after the April bank robbery, declared the vehicle an explosive hazard. Given the history, we had a concern that this vehicle may, may contain a device as well. The natural thing to expect, given this was kind of the second go-round, was that having uh, been unsuccessful the first time, um, they, would, they would try harder the second time. 
deputies smelled a strong gasoline odor. But again, it was difficult to see what kind of device might be inside. Rather than risk sending in a squad member, explosives disposal technicians once again deployed their specialized robot. The technicians operated the robot remotely from the safety of inside the EDU truck. We sent the robot down range uh, in an effort to scout the vehicle and see what we could see. The robot was equipped with a video camera, remote-controlled eyes for the explosives disposal unit. Technicians guided the robot to peer inside the van looking for a bomb. The windows of this particular van had been darkened, so um, we weren't able to see much of anything at all. They tried the robot's lights. Oh, too much window tint on it. I can't see anything out of the back either. Yeah, also. There seemed to be something in the van, but the robot's camera still couldn't see clearly through the window tinting. Can't see anything out of that window, can you? Oh, no. They needed to know what the object was. We elected to use the robot uh, to shoot a window out of the van and open it so that we could see inside. The technicians then activated the robot's water cannon disruptor, which fires a slug by water pressure rather than gunpowder, so sparks are less likely. All right. Nice job, buddy. Why don't we see if we can get some of that glass right over the window so we've got a good view of the inside. Okay. They used the robot's powerful claw to clear the glass. Once the window was broken, uh, we were able to see inside the van and observe what appeared to be an incendiary device. It looks like a couple propane cylinders, timer, and I'm not sure what that is, yeah, taped into the timer. It looks like an initiator. Right down here? Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the window. It appeared that it was intended to uh, initiate a fire in the van, burn the van, uh, thereby leaving us very little evidence. The explosives disposal technician guided the robot to clear the bomb from the van. He then moved the bomb to a more remote area so they could render it safe. There it is. They again used the water cannon disruptor. Take your shot when you're ready. Ready? All right. Just open it right up. In the protective suit, a technician checked the bomb and confirmed it had been rendered safe. Yeah, it looks like he's all clear down there. Once again, the suspects had used a stolen van. But this time, investigators found no manifestos or other evidence inside. Although there were three assailants in the latest robbery, the FBI believed the same individuals robbed the bank three months earlier. For help, they turned to forensic examiner Richard Vorderbrugge of the FBI's Audio, Video, and Image Analysis Unit. Similar clothing and weapons suggested two of the gunmen took part in both robberies. Vorderbrugge analyzed surveillance video to determine their heights. I used a technique called perspective analysis photogrammetry. Uh, that involves taking a set of measurements of fixed objects within the scene, uh, determining the specific perspective of the scene, that is to say how the camera itself was related to fixed objects within the scene. Because the cameras were facing downward, Vorderbrugge had to use complex mathematics to determine how actual size is reflected at that angle. He then compared the measurements of the fixed objects, such as a table leg, to the relative height of the bank robbers. 
he concluded the two robbers from the April 1st robbery were very likely two of the three from the July robbery. One of them was approximately five feet, seven and a half inches, and the second robber was approximately six feet, one inch. And by finding, as I did, that the heights of the two individuals in the bank in each case were about the same, it certainly helped strengthen uh, the case that they were the same people involved. With the robberies and bombings likely committed by individuals calling themselves Phineas Priests, the FBI elevated the status of the suspects. We decided that they were not here for the sole purpose of uh, robbing a bank and taking the money. These guys had a message that they were trying to get out to the public, and it was causing havoc in the city of Spokane. Uh, a lot of people were concerned about uh, their safety, and as a result, the FBI felt like um, you know what, these are, these are terrorists. To help capture the domestic terror suspects, the U.S. Bank offered a $100,000 reward. Despite the reward, a month passed with no new leads. Agents believed the terrorists were out there training, getting ready to strike again. After authorities linked several robberies and bombings in Spokane to a suspected group of domestic terrorists, the targeted bank offered a $100,000 reward, and the FBI released a composite sketch of the getaway driver. A month after the second bank robbery in August 1996, the reward offer generated a promising lead an informant came forward, saying he thought he knew the man in the composite sketch. The informant, a licensed firearms dealer, believed he met the man and a few others several months earlier. It was before the bank robberies began. He sold a group of men, military clothing and equipment. One of the men looked like the driver in the sketch. The informant said they asked about buying plastic explosives and a bazooka. Then they asked for his help outfitting their SUVs with tank armor and bipod-mounted machine guns. But he wanted nothing to do with such illegal activities. Before he left, one of them bragged that a small group of well-prepared men was going to bring the banking establishment to its knees. The informant said he met the men at an auto repair shop owned by one of them. The shop was located in the small town of Sandpoint, Idaho, about 75 miles northeast of Spokane. In late August, the FBI went to Sandpoint to investigate the lead. Agents rented an abandoned building with a view of the auto repair shop and discreetly watched the suspects as they outfitted their SUVs. FBI Special Agent Mark Cullinan believed they might have found the robbers. When observing these uh, subjects' daily activities, it was suspicious to us, first of all, that they didn't have any uh, noticeable means of employment. That was an indicator to us uh, that, that they're gaining money or the means to operate uh, through other methods. Since we didn't know what had happened to the money from the bank robberies, so this was a possibility. Agents photographed the suspects and anyone seen on the premises. One of the individuals we identified as Robert Barry. Barry ran uh, an automotive repair shop uh, in the Sandpoint area, but didn't seem to be doing any business, didn't seem to be using it to, to generate any income. Agents identified a second suspect as Charles Barbie. Although Barbie had no record of convictions, he had been arrested for trying to buy supplies from military personnel. Barbie and Barry matched the heights of the bank robbers given by forensics experts. The FBI determined the third man was Vern Merrill. Merrill appeared to be the leader of the group. 
and he resembled witness descriptions of the getaway drivers seen at the bombings and bank robberies. Agents needed more information on the men. They took a risk to get it. One night in early September, after the suspects left the shop, surveillance teams installed a hidden video camera on a telephone pole behind the garage. Agents didn't know if the area was booby-trapped or if they themselves were being watched. The teams got out safely. Looks like they're shooting a assault rifle. What the camera revealed was chilling. Agents watched the men test different weapons and types of bullets to see which could pierce the steel of car doors and the Kevlar of bulletproof vests. It was clear they were preparing for battle. During weeks of surveillance, the FBI tailed the suspects from the ground in the air as they drove to various cities in the Pacific Northwest. Agents believe the men were casing banks. On September 6, 1996, two months after the second robbery, the bank, newspaper office, and health clinic previously targeted received threatening letters promising further violent attacks. Authorities developed contingency plans that would allow them to follow the robbers to their next target. So far, they've hit us twice. They can't choose wherever it might be. But that's not to say they couldn't take any of the other back roads uh, down to meet or intersect I-90. So what we have to do is come up with points far enough away that they can't take a back road and get around behind us uh, before getting in their home territory up there. A month later, on October 8th, investigators on the stakeout observed what they believed were final preparations for another bank robbery. Okay, listen up, unit. They're all leaving now. Three white male occupants. Plant they contacted Special Agent David Bedford. 69213. They're leaving now. I received a phone call from the agent that was actually watching them load up. I started calling a lot of other co-workers saying, get in your car, start heading towards Sandpoint because something's going on and we need everybody up there as soon as possible. And so we began our surveillance, not knowing where they were going to end up. The FBI tailed the suspects as they headed west out of Sandpoint. Their license plates indicated the truck was to be used in a crime. That the plates on the Suburban did not match front to rear, and both had been reported stolen. This also added a new sense of urgency to our investigation. They followed the men 400 miles west, across the Oregon border. The individual looks like he's breaking into a van. In Hood River, Oregon, agents watched the men steal a van from a used car lot and add it to their convoy. If the FBI was correct, the suspects planned to use the stolen van in a bank robbery and abandon it afterwards. We observed the vehicles uh, stop at a truck stop uh, where they shifted some gear between vehicles. They did some moving around and some planning, and then they departed again in one vehicle. As agents shadowed the van, they realized where the suspects were headed. By approximately 6 o'clock in the morning, we were hundreds of miles away from where we had started and on the outskirts of Portland. We watched them drive a meandering route into the city. By 10 o'clock, it was clear which Portland bank the suspects intended to hit. They're making a left into a parking lot. Appears to be a bank. And 
And as we uh, watched them pull into one of the bank parking lots, we notified the bank. They immediately locked the doors to the bank, keeping all of their customers and everybody inside. And our plan was, as they exited the vans to go up and enter into the enter the bank to Robert, we were going to arrest them. What do you think? Agents waited for the suspects to make their move. Good here. Good I like it. All right, they're in front of the bank. I was approximately 30 yards away from them. And with my binoculars, I could see exactly what they were doing inside the van. And that was pulling out their, their guns. They were donning masks. They were putting on their camouflage gear. And they were getting ready to make a break towards the bank. And it was at that time they saw the same things that we saw. The uh, customers that were trying to get into the bank were unsuccessful because the bank had been locked. It looked like the suspects were standing down. The field agents called in for instructions. Let's keep surveillance on the vehicle. Our agents were conferring with the United States Attorney's Office, with uh, the heads of our divisions, and making a determination as to whether we had enough evidence at this point uh, to arrest these subjects. While the team conferred, surveillance units followed the stolen van as the suspects retrieved their Suburban. They started driving back towards Washington, and we continued to follow them. Soon they got the go-ahead for the arrest. Now they needed to find the safest opportunity to do so. On the next stop, all units converge. When the subjects stopped for gas at uh, Union Gap, Washington, we decided that that was a, a, the best place that we had in order to effect an arrest. But with such violent and heavily armed suspects, there was no guarantee of a safe arrest scenario. After months of investigating domestic terror suspects, surveillance units tailed them to a Union Gap, Washington gas station. Two of the suspects stayed in one of their vehicles while the third entered the gas station. With the suspects split up, the lead agent put the operation in motion. Temple, put your back. They needed to synchronize the arrests, so all three suspects were surprised. FBI, you're under arrest. Don't move, you're under arrest. FBI, you're under arrest. Take your car, take your car. 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 Vern Merrill. Robert Berry. And Charles Barbie were arrested without a fight. Special Agent David Bedford discovered things could have gone much differently. Following the arrest, we did a search of the vehicles they were driving. We found hand grenades, uh, thousands of rounds of ammunition, um, probably half a dozen different types of weapons, gas masks, tear gas canisters. Um, these guys were definitely ready for battle. Agents also found a threatening letter to the Spokane Bank that had been robbed twice. Despite the three arrests, the FBI knew one suspect was still at large. One of the things that was a question in our minds was on the uh, July 12th robbery, there was three people that came inside and a getaway driver. We were still unsure who the fourth robber was. Agents interviewed friends and associates of the arrested suspects. They learned the fourth man was most likely Brian Radigan. 
One of the things that concerned the FBI was Brian Radigan's military experience. He apparently had some training in sniper school, and so the surveillance, the investigation that we did uh, regarding Brian was very careful, very thought out. Those who knew Radigan said he was heavily armed, well-trained, and paranoid. We just throw that in there. All right. The FBI wanted to avoid a violent confrontation, as did the suspect's family. We solicited help from Brian Radigan's family members who, after talking to them some t for some time, felt that it would be in his best interest if he came forward and was arrested. And so a family member sent a train ticket to Brian and his wife. The ticket was for a phony departure at a time when the FBI knew no other passengers would be at a Washington state train station. Undercover agents posed as station employees. When Radigan seemed at ease, they made their move. Radigan had no way to fight back or run. He and the others would be tried for their crimes, not their political or religious views. The FBI does not investigate individuals or groups based on their beliefs. We investigate crimes. We investigated these acts because they were violent crimes. They were bombings, they were bank robberies. Uh, we would investigate them as we would any other uh, violent crime. On July 24th, 1997, Charles Barbie, Robert Berry, and Vern Merrill were found guilty on eight counts related to the bombings and armed robberies and were each sentenced to life in prison. In a separate trial, Brian Radigan was found guilty of similar charges and sentenced to 55 years. Although that one Phineas Priesthood cell is behind bars, the FBI and experts like Spokesman Review reporter Bill Moreland know other domestic terrorist groups are still out there. Since 1996, uh, the number of militia cells has dropped off, but I believe there still are a number of them out there, and they're as hardcore and deeper underground than ever, and every bit as dangerous. If these groups do commit crimes, the FBI will not stop until they are dismantled. 